All right, so that's that's a good start. We went through some homework. Nick Nick asked a question today about an identity problem. Okay, and if you take a look at the table of contents of our book, here let me jump to it. Um, right here. So, section three we just finished. Section four is on trigonometric identities. Okay, I can also tell you this. Section four, in my opinion is a big, tough section. I'm only going to tackle part of it now. And we're going to have your first exam in a couple weeks. It's going to cover sections one through five. But when I say that, only part of section four. You'll see. I'm going to assign some homework tonight, and also we'll do some more homework next uh, Monday. But it's just like the first few sections, the first few identities, basically, out of 10.4. We'll revisit the rest of it that we need later. Okay. I mean, already we're starting to learn some identities. We learned the Pythagorean identities, and we learned what you might call the reciprocal identities, right? So, what's the reciprocal of cosine? Secant. Okay. So, so that's an identity. That's always true. And so, so we learned some of those things already. Well, you're going to see in 10.4 here, we're going to hit some more identities, okay? So they're going to talk about even and odd identities. Um, but before I can do that, I need to maybe recall a little bit of what you learned in college algebra. All right. So today... What did we do? We start 10.4 trigonometric identities. And 10.5 graphs of the trig functions. But I have to take it slow. Well, there's a lot in these sections. And when I'm going to say we're going to start graphing the trig functions, there's six of them. I don't want to do that. I just want to stick, stick with the sine and cosine, like I, like I did when I started the unit circle. Okay? So today, let's talk about y equals the sine of t and y equals the cosine of t. Okay? And I think... If I start by talking about the graphs and then move back to the identities, I think you'll understand what I'm, what I'm doing. Now, this is maybe a little different notation than we've had. First of all, what have I usually been putting after the sine or the cosine? What letter have I usually been using? Theta. Theta, okay. I'm going to use T for now. And the idea is, if I want to graph y equals sine of t, well, what you have, you guys have to understand the idea here is function. I'd like to pause, and I want you to spend 30 seconds talking to the person next to you about what you've learned so far about functions. You guys in college algebra last semester, that's all you studied. But I want to get some of it out in the open, so I'm pausing, and you can say hello to who's next to you and talk about that for 30 seconds. I mean, a lot of times we don't write functions this way. What we'll write instead is something like f of t is the sine of t. That's another way of writing y equals sine of t, right? Let me ask this. Which number, which variable up here stands for the input, the number that I'm going to put into the function. And it's very clear when it's written that way, right? t is your input. y here, or f of t, whichever I'm using, would be the output. Input and output is a basic concept. You, you want to know why we study functions? Because we use computers all the time. We give them input, they give us output. You guys with me? So. When I go ahead and graph a function, I put the input where? Well, along the horizontal axis. Usually that's the x-axis, right? 
If I'm calling it t, well, that's fine. And then I could call this f of t. That would be the y. So I could graph f of t is the sine of t. Now there's a real reason that I might want to graph it this way with these letters. Because remember what I did earlier. I drew a unit circle, right? And in the unit circle, you're already kind of using x and y, right? We had an x-axis and a y-axis. So if I'm already using that, then maybe I change the letters. You guys with me? Now, t is taking the place of theta. Remember, theta was how far you rotate. So if I rotate, if suppose theta is pi over 4. That's the same as what, by the way? 45. 45. And so that's the radical 2 over 2, radical 2 over 2, right? So what we can do is we can move along the t-axis a certain amount. We move out to whatever pi over 4 is. That's the input for the function. So f of pi over 4 would equal, well, the sine of pi over 4, right? And we just said that's radical 2 over 2. So the output, now how big is the radical 2 over 2? Well, I have a calculator. Here. Oh, not there, I don't. Where'd it go? Here it is. So if I type in square root of 2 divided by 2, enter. That's about 0.7, right? So I don't know. If I mark that this is, say, 1, and say this is negative 1, then my output would be, well, 0.7. So part way up there, there's the point. And that point would be pi over 4, comma, radical 2 over 2. You guys with me? By the way, how big is pi? 3.14. Okay, a little more than 3. 3.14, right? So if that's 1, and I'm trying to draw this to scale, then 2, 3, Somewhere out here would be pi. Somewhere in here, for example, would be pi over 2. And then this point might be 3 pi over 4. And you could go ahead and plot lots of points. For example, where it says pi over 2, what's the sign of pi over 2? I could look on my picture again. Pi over 2 is this angle right here, right? if I rotate up that much. So what's the sine of pi over 2? One. one. It's the y coordinate. The sine of pi over 2 is going to be 1. I'm going to have a dot right there. Pi over 2 comma 1. And now I'm getting a little bit messy. And so I'm about to go to a nicer diagram. By the way, if I want to show that on the calculator, I have to be in radian mode or I'll get it wrong. Let me go back to the home screen and let me type in, for example, sine of pi over 2 graph. Graph didn't work. I had to, <laughs> I'm graphing some line. I have to press enter. One. Okay. Now I can graph this thing. If I clear this out, I could say, hey, I want to plot the sine of x. Oh, it's going to put an x, not a t. And don't let that confuse you, right? Enter. And if I press graph, let's see what happens. Well, that's a kind of nice picture. It's a wave. It's one of the reasons we study the trig trigonometry at all, is because these are waves. Now, why is that happening? Well, for example, on my sketch, I didn't plot this yet, but, but what's the sine of 0? 
Well, look at a zero degree angle. What's the sign? It's the y coordinate. So what is it? Zero. zero. So the sine of zero is zero. But notice, if instead we look at the sine of pi, the sine of pi, well, that's the point negative one, zero, and so the sine of pi is also zero. You see that? So the sine function goes as high as one, and then it goes back down to zero. You with me? And as I continue rotating around the circle, what's going to be true about all those sine values is they're all going to be negative. And what's the lowest sine value you'll ever get? Negative one. Negative one. So <clears throat> the wave continues. And actually, where would that be? When do you get to negative one? Well, that's down here. Let's see. Pi over 2, pi. When I plug in 3 pi over 2, right, the output is negative 1. And then it comes back up to 0 when I get to 2 pi. And like I said, I'm getting sloppy now. There's things I can do with the calculator that can help. If I hit my zoom button, you can change the window. And if you notice choice number seven, this is going to be real helpful tonight on the homework. Zoom trig. If I press enter on that, it draws a zoomed in picture. But what it does, if you hit the window, it's kind of interesting. See that x min and x max? Negative 6.15? Why is it doing that? Well, what it's trying to do is go out 2 pi in each direction so that you could see uh, what happens in, in terms of period. Okay? So if I go back to the graph, and if I hit the trace button, for instance, okay, it's at 0, 0. But I can move along until I get here. There's, a, there's an important point. 1.57, guess what that is? What input is that? That gives you an output of 1. Here, let me show you. I'm going to hit second calculate a value. And the, the value that I'm going to type in is I'm going to type in pi divided by 2. Because pi over 2 means that my angle in the unit circle, I'm looking there, and so I'm looking at the y-coordinate 1. There's your y-coordinate 1. You guys see that? This is your basic sine function. And if you look at the, uh, the book, when we go to section 5, let me do that. So the beginning of section 5, we're talking page 790. He's going to talk about periodic functions. I'll get to that in a minute. But the first thing he does is he says, hey, let me start making a table of some inputs and outputs. And so he does pi over 4. He does pi over 2. He's getting, by the way, this is not the sine function. Which one is this? This is cosine. Let me show you sine. Here's sine. That's the, that's the curve I was just graphing. You guys see it? Now it goes on forever. If you take a look down just a little bit lower, here's the sine function that I was just graphing on the calculator. But he's just showing you what he calls one fundamental cycle. What, why does the pattern repeat over and over? Because it's the same as going around and around what? The unit circle. You guys see that? OK. Now, there's some ideas. I asked you guys to talk a little bit because I was hoping some of these ideas might come up. Here's a statement in a gray box that they want us to know. There's some words, domain and range. You guys remember doing that? Well, what are they? Let me define them because I'm not going to assume anything here. So we talk about domain and we talk about range of these functions, OK? So domain is always the set of all possible inputs. 
and the range is the set of all possible outputs. Well, I'm going to tell you that for sine and cosine, the domain is all real numbers. You can put any number you want in, and you could take that to be an angle, a rotation of some kind. Even zero, we can, we can graph the sine of zero, because that just means you don't rotate at all. Be the same as the sine of 2 pi. So I'm going to say that the domain for these functions is from negative infinity to infinity. But what about the range? What kind of outputs are you going to get? Well, I claim there's a highest output you can get, right? What's the maximum value you can get for an output? One. And the minimum value is negative one. And so you'll notice that the range of these functions is this. See what else he says? It's continuous and smooth. Well, that means it's a nice roller coaster ride. Actually, it means more, but you need calculus for me to say much more. Continuous, the basic idea is that I could draw it without picking up my pencil. And smooth means I don't have any sharp points anywhere. Okay? But I can't prove that stuff until I get to uh, calculus class. Um, it says, now here's the one that's different. So far, everything's the same. The, the one thing that it says is different it says that cosine is even and sine is odd. And I want to talk about what that means. But let me point out the one that's the same. It says that it has period 2 pi. What that means is that's how far you have to move before it starts repeating. When you look at the one we did, Remember, we got back to zero when we hit the pi. And then we went through the negative values, and we get back to zero once you come around to 2 pi. But now, if you want to find the sine of 3 pi, well, you'd keep rotating. You're going to go back through the positive values. Does that make sense? And so the period right here, this is the period. And that equals 2 pi. Okay? All right. Even and odd. That I should remind you guys of. Okay? So here's your definition. A function is even if f of negative x is equal to f of x. So my favorite example of an even function give you an examples. How about y equals x squared? Right? What's that look like? My little parabola that goes right through 0, 0. And for example, if you plug in 2, what's the output? 4. And if you plug in negative 2, what's the output? Isn't it true that f of negative x is equal to f of x? Absolutely. By the way, an even function will also have symmetry. It will be symmetric about, what am I going to say here? That parabola. Yeah, the y-axis, good. So if you spin it around the y-axis, it looks exactly the same. Now I'm going to say another definition over here. A function is odd if, do you guys know this one? f of negative x equals, well, how about an example of an odd function? y equals x cubed is a nice example of an odd function. What's that? Negative. Yeah, f of negative x has to be negative f of x. Uh, let me show this example more in depth. 
Do you guys know what y equals x cubed the graph looks like? Some don't. Show me with your hands, those that do. I'll show you with my calculator in the meantime. I mean, you're right. Here, if I go y equals, and let me just do x cubed. And let me change the zoom out of trig. Let me just go back to the standard zoom, choice 6, and graph it. It looks like that. You guys with me? And for example, what happens if I um, evaluate this function at the value uh, x equals 2? What's 2 cubed? Come on, what's 2 cubed? Hello? 8, right? What happens if you cube negative 2, though? What do you get? You get negative 8. You guys with me? So that's why f of negative x is going to be the opposite of f of x. Okay? The negative kind of comes out, if you want. That's why it's negative 8. And so the picture, of course, is like that. And so it has symmetry also, but it's different. We say that it is symmetric about the origin. Do you know what I mean by the origin? What point is that, the origin? Zero, zero. zero, zero. And so what I'm saying is if you took a hammer and a nail and you nailed into that origin and you spun the thing 180 degrees, it should look the same. Right? That's what, that's what we mean by an odd function. So now if I go back to what Stitch says about the, uh, the cosine and the sine, he says that cosine is even and sine is odd. And I guess the best way to see that is here. Look at that function, cosine. Do you see that if I spun it around the y-axis, it would look the same? But that's not true for a sine. The sine function actually goes through the origin. It's an odd function. You guys with me? And now why do we talk about even and odd? Well, now I can go back to section 4 on identities. And so the very first thing they want to tell you in section 4 is, hey, we have some identities. Let me go to them called the even and odd identities, right? Well, look. Cosine of negative theta is cosine of theta. That's because cosine is what kind of function? Even. And sine is what kind of function? Odd. odd. Well, OK. I know I had it up there, but I am going to ask this question now. <coughs> so we have an example of an even function y equals cosine of x is even, y equals sine of x is odd. Those are nice to know. OK, question. What about this function, f of x equals tangent of x. Is that one going to be even or odd? Or neither? There's also the possibility that it might be neither. Well, the way to test, I mean, you could graph it. That helps. But the best way to test if it's even or odd is we want to look at f of negative x. Okay? So watch how this works. f of negative x. Well, that means we have the tangent of negative x. OK? And I'm going to say that I know what tangent of negative x means. It means sine of negative x over what? Cosine. Sine over cosine. Cosine of negative x. So that's just what the definition of tangent is. It's sine over cosine. All right, dudes. Cosine of negative x, that denominator. What do I know about cosine? Cosine is what kind of function? Even. Even. So I claim I can take that denominator, and where it used to say cosine of negative x, since it's even, we could just write cosine of x. Because that's, that's what it means to be even. 
Now for sine, that's not true. Where it used to say sine of negative x, sine is an odd function. So what can I write in the numerator? Negative sine of x. And again, what am I doing here? I'm using the fact that sine is odd. And down here I use the fact that cosine is even. But anyways, what I end up getting is I get one negative sign, which means this equals negative tangent of x. So what did we just prove, guys? Tangent is an odd function. Tangent of x is odd. You guys have been saying that for a while. This whole course is odd. Well, no, tangent is odd. Okay? And actually, that's what happens here at the top, is they have these even and odd identities. Okay? But we proved one of them for you. You can do the others kind of in a similar way. Moving on. Oh, the song. There's a bunch of gray boxes here. And by the end of this course, you're going to know almost everything in every gray box. It's hard to believe. But I'm sure not going to teach it the way he does. Well, actually, if you... Oh, this is funny. I I'm just going to spend 20 seconds on this. Here's a few identities that you're about to learn. All right? Here's the proof of why they work. It's actually beautiful that he does this. A lot of books don't. And it's kind of like, oh, here's identities. Good luck. Now, he shows you. He's using something from college algebra called the distance formula. Raise your hand if you've heard of that before. Thank you. What's the distance formula? Square root of? Something. Square root of? I just don't have a square root. Come on, you know more than that. What do you know? X1? Yeah, x squared plus y squared, right? That's the Pythagorean theorem, really. And then what you do with those x's is you say x1 minus x2 and y1 minus y2 or something like that because you have two points. That's what he's doing. Except instead of putting x's, what's he putting? Cosines. And instead of putting y's, what's he putting? All right, so he does a whole lot of work. And by the way, any time that he sees a sine squared plus a cosine squared, what does sine squared plus cosine squared equal? One. Oh, that's one of my new identities, yeah. He's going to use that a lot, and he's going to do a whole lot of work. But I'm done. That's all I'm doing with that. I am moving on, and it's time to sing. So I'm telling you that in a matter of moments, I'll have us knowing those identities right there called the sum and difference identities with a little song. So let's move on, and uh, let's pause for the time being. So. I'm in section 10.4, identities again, and I'm going to cover what are called the double angle formulas, right? And so we have our little song now that gets me to memorize these. But what my question was just recently, I asked you guys, can you give me the formula for cosine of alpha minus beta? And so you guys would say, cosine, cosine, sine, sine, right? And you'd say cosine of alpha, cosine of beta, what would you put here? Plus. Plus sine of alpha, sine of beta. Okay. And actually, one thing you might be asking, we've been having fun, but why? Why would we ever want to do this? Well, just on the quiz the other day, um, do I have it? Yeah, I do. Remember I asked you guys to find, convert these to degrees, and so you guys took 5 pi over 12, right? And you changed it to degrees. How many degrees did it end up being? 75. 75 degrees? Okay. One thing I could have asked you guys is this. Hey, find me the cosine of 5 pi over 12. Well, you might be out of luck because you didn't have your calculator, for one. And number two, um, 75 degrees isn't one of the nice angles, right? But with the double angle formula, you can do some really cool things. So, for example, suppose I want to find the sine of 75 degrees. Okay? 
Well, that is equal to the sine of 45 degrees plus 30 degrees, right? And see, those are both angles that I'm very familiar with. So watch how this works. Oh, let me write down the sine identity. So here, sine of, well, we're doing plus. So let me do alpha plus beta. And let me go through the song. Sine, cosine, cosine, sine, right? So it's sine of alpha, cosine beta. What goes here? David, what goes here? Plus or minus, which one? Plus, because that's plus, sine the same. Cosine of alpha, sine beta, right? And so I'm gonna use that formula in my example here. I'm gonna use that black formula. Everywhere it says alpha, what am I gonna put? You guys see? What's 45 degrees is taking the place of alpha. So I'll write sine of 45. I'll write cosine of 30. Okay. Plus cosine of 45 sine of 30. And these are all degrees, right? And here's where, oh yeah, that unit circle might actually really help. You know, that quiz that we did over here. But let me work it out for you. So sine of 45 degrees is the square root of 2 over 2. 30 degrees, what's the cosine of 30 degrees? Isn't it square root of 3 over 2? Right. You can check that on the unit circle if you don't believe me. What's the cosine of 45 degrees? Square root of 2 over 2. And the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. And so now if I ask you, what does the sine of 45 degrees equal? Well, you can multiply these together and you'll get the square root of 6 over 4. And if you multiply these together, you'll get the square root of 2 over 4. So I guess I would conclude that the sine of 75 degrees is equal to the square root of 6 plus the square root of 2 all over what? If anyone says 8, I'm going to go crazy, right? 4. Or if anyone says square root of 8, I'll be equally mad. You can't add those radicals, okay? There's my answer. And so we're going to practice using these identities uh, on the homework tonight in section four. But these identities do come up quite a bit. And in particular, they, they're used in that long proof talking about, um, well, you'll see it there. OK, wow. Um, 10-5 exercises, there's two sets that I gave you. The second set is just verifying identities using your calculator. It's like you'll graph one side of the equation, you'll graph the other side of the equation, should look the same. That's easy. But the other part is this exercise is 1 to 12 here at the top. It says graph one cycle of the given function. State the period, the amplitude, the phase shift and the vertical shift of the function. What the heck am I talking about? Well, let's use the calculator to help. And, and we're going to talk about this more next time. Let me start just by talking about problem two. I'm supposed to graph y equals the sine of 3x. One thing that will help you here is if you start by just graphing the basic function, sine of x, and then graph the new function. You want to learn how these things work. Let's use the technology to help, OK? So if I press graph, oh, yeah, this is OK. Ooh, check that out. One thing that will help you is if you use different windows. So like for example, if I hit zoom trig choice 7. And another thing I can do is as it's drawing, if I ever press enter, it will pause so I can talk. Right now we're graphing sine of x, right? What I want to know is what's different when I graph y equals sine of 3x? Can you explain? 
What's different? Talk to someone next to you about that for 20 seconds. That'd be worth talking about. I heard some absolutely great things said during that 20 seconds. Some people said it was squished. I heard someone mention the word frequency. It's a different frequency, and you are absolutely right. It's someone talked about the period changing. The period is how quickly it repeats. This one repeats more often. This one repeats sooner. The period is smaller here. Okay? By the way, normally the period of the sine function we said was 2 pi. The period of this function in number 2 would be 2 pi divided by 3. Okay? Now, there's a lot more to this. You're going to need to use your book when you work on these exercises. Oh, here's a picture of what's called amplitude. Amplitude is kind of the distance from the center line to the maximum value. What's the amplitude of the sine function usually? One. Okay. If I just move down a little bit, this, by the way, this is on your, in your book. You might want to mark down page 795. They give you the sine and cosine functions, and they throw all kinds of letters in there. And they say, hey, if you want to figure out what the period is, or the amplitude, or the phase shift, or the vertical shift, and, and you can do it this way. I'll just finish in my last minute by showing you how I would do problem two with this little gray box. Oh, I had it and I lost it. I'll see if it comes back. So I would write y equals the sine of 3x. Is that what it was? OK. So I'm looking at that picture, and I'm looking at here, and I'm looking at s of x up in the, in the box. And I'm saying the only thing that I think we changed was omega, that little, looks like a w, is 3. And that's why, what's my period going to be? Well, look at the gray box. It says it's 2 pi over omega. That's why I said it was 2 pi over 3. But the amplitude is still 1 because you didn't put anything in front of the sign. And, and the one last thing I'll talk to you about is that those of you that took college algebra with us, section 1.7 is on transformations. And that's exactly what we're going to do with these trig functions is transform them. So if you studied that and got familiar with that, that's exactly what's going on here. Nice work today, guys. It was a good class. We're at 1045. Uh, I am free today for a little bit. Um,